Hey guys, and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. Hope you guys are doing good out there. Today, we have a really special episode, and I was really excited to be able to hear this man's story. Dan got in contact with me and wanted to share his Bigfoot encounters and experiences from the mountains of Washington. He claims he was camping up in the mountains and a Sasquatch came out of the forest, walked up to his tent, and started feeling his head like a basketball. As he woke up, he could feel a hand covering and feeling his entire head. He also had a Bigfoot encounter while stalking elk up in the mountains. He really gives a good description of the creature. And like I said, I think you guys will really enjoy this interview. Sasquatch is common knowledge in Washington, and I think many of its residents would agree that Bigfoot exists. In 1975, the Army Corps of Engineers created an atlas for the state of Washington. This was a real Bigfoot document created by the government and is now overlooked by today's world. Dan also shares many other experiences he has had, so with that being said, Let's dive straight into this next Bigfoot encounter from the state of Washington. Dan, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. And you? Oh, not too bad. Dan, if you would, could you break down your Bigfoot encounters from <laughs> beginning, middle to end? Sure. So uh, let me give you a little bit about myself. Mm -hmm. I am a, I'm already 65 years old, and I started hunting uh, deer uh, at the age of nine. And I hunted every year, and I hunted a lot. And then uh, when I got old enough to drive, I was hunting all the time. And uh, my dad, you know, uh, he just lost interest in hunting. And I hunted. And I grew up uh, with a couple guys um, who I've known my whole life. We met about the age of 14 or so. And we hunted and fished and, and uh, chased the girls and all that stuff for years and uh, we went uh, through divorces and and uh, supported each other and everything and these guys are really good hunters and fishermen um and these guys are good and uh, while we've been hunting um as a team we haven't uh, run in to bigfoot um and i'm surprised because of how deep we went in to the woods and uh i live in the state of washington on the west coast and that is a hot spot you know for bigfoot but uh it it seems that i had i had uh, most of my encounters with bigfoot i was alone and uh the first one i had i was about uh, 27 and i took another friend with me to bow hunt for blacktail deer up by Gold Bar, Washington. That's a little, little town. I mean, if you blink, you missed it. But uh, it's uh, to the north of Monroe, Washington. And um, if you go to Gold Bar, I think it's just past Gold Bar. On the right is a forest road, and it's called a Foss River uh, Road. And uh, Oh, we shot some big bucks up there, I tell you, man, over the years. But uh, the black tails, and we're up there bow hunting. And our plan was to, I had another friend um, who wasn't uh, one of the two guys I had, had hunted for all my life with. And I took him up there, and we were shooting bow and arrow a lot for for quite a few years, you know, we'd like uh, going at the range and we had uh, compound bowls and we got really, really good at it. 
and over the years i killed deer with it uh and so we're up there on a friday uh, later in the daytime about i don't know two o'clock or three o'clock and we set up our camp up that road and we went up that road for quite a ways it goes it goes a long ways and we parked at the end of a, a skid road that they used for logging a years ago and uh it was a dead end i think most of those skid roads go in about 100 yards or so and uh or maybe more you know and, and and we made our camp you know with the tent and we had an old army tent I, I remember this thing it was it was a greenish brown if you will and it was a it was a large tent and you could stand up in it and so uh we did that and then we went out and scouted a little bit and um we then uh, came back and our plan was wake up you know in the morning uh before daylight and get on out there and split up and sit and wait and watch some trails and stuff and i'd already been hunting this area so i had a pretty good idea of where game was and uh we hunted that day and and split up and that was before the days of us having radios you know a handheld radio for communication which is really handy i mean if you get hurt you know you always got a radio and you get some help immediately from your buddy and uh, we came back about noon and we had uh, lunch and then we went back out and we went up this this uh, road i remember it was a side road off the skid road and i i i talked with my friend i says i says what um why don't we split up and you go up uh, the road a little further than me and get off at the edge of the old skid road it had uh, trees actually growing up in the middle of the road Okay, so you couldn't even drive a vehicle on it, you know, uh, maybe a dirt bike, you know, um, and we split up. And uh, he went up uh, the road, uh, he later told me about a couple hundred yards and uh, sat down uh, just off of the edge of this, had a game trail and sat. And I, I did the same thing. But... Um, and my friend was up the road a little bit further. I was sitting there for a long time. I had I had uh, rattling horns, and I had a grunt tube, and we both had bucks. In it, you know that stinky stuff. And we actually put that on our hat, right? <laughs> so you could come back and swap hats when you got back because the hat would stink. That was so funny. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and about an hour before dark i hear what sounds like uh, somebody running and they're running towards me down the road now my friend because uh, he wanted to be stealthy he was wearing uh, tennis shoes um it was the old uh, converse of black and white ones you know and this guy's pretty tall, you know, about uh, six, two or three. And he's got big feet, you know, like I do. And uh, I, he gets closer and it's going like, pat, 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 pat. And I go, what the hell is that? And it went on for a long time and it got closer and closer. And there was a bend in the road there. and it was about to reach the end of the road and i i wasn't thinking it it was a game animal but i still raised my bow and i brought it back and for safety i i aimed at the trees just to the right of where the bend in the road was and waited for whatever it was you know there's bears up there too and i here comes my friend 
he can he's he's he has his ball in his hand and he's running and i go i go hey what's up and he goes run <laughs> run <laughs> and the guy was really really serious you know the look on his face i mean the guy was red in the face from the running and i says what are we running from he says just run i'll tell you later and he's breathing hard and i start laughing you know and i go well okay i ran but before i ran i pulled out a 357 just on the off a chance it was uh, something dangerous you know like a bear i was thinking well, nothing came up uh, behind us at all. And um, he ran all the way to camp. And the first thing that he did was get in his truck and and he pulled out a 44 Magnum. And, you know, he laid his bow down and, man, he picked up that uh, 44 out of his truck. And I go, what are you doing? He says, it was a bear. And I says, well, you got a bear tag you know did you have a shot what happened he says well it was looking at me out of the thick bushes along the edge of that of that road you know we walked up and i says uh how far away was it and he says well i don't know 20 yards it's maybe 30 and i says uh, what did you see and he says, all I saw was a big black head and it was looking right at me. And I says, was it a bear? And he goes, I don't know. I says, well, why did you say run? And and now uh, you're questioning whether it was a bear. I says, what color was it? And he goes, jet black. And I said, well, um, could you recognize the face as a bear? And he says, I don't know. And I says, what do you mean? Was there a snout on it? And it was lighter color? And he goes, no, it was all black. And I figured the only thing it could be was a black bear because it was black. And I says, what made you run? And he says, I got a creepy feeling. It, I can't explain it, but it was a creepy feeling. And immediately I thought I should just get the hell out of there. And I says, is all you saw was the head? And he says, yeah, that's all I saw. I says, well, um, do you remember a uh, height off the ground? I mean, like a black bear would be, say, uh, four feet off the ground at the most, you know, maybe three feet. And he goes, no, it was higher than that. It was almost a shoulder um, height of me. And I go, well, okay, maybe the bear was standing up. And, and and put his paws on a log and uh, poked his head out of the bushes and looked at you. And he goes, I don't know, maybe, he says, but it was just a weird looking head and face. And I said, face? And he goes, well, all I know is it was big and it was round and it was black and it had eyeballs. And I says, well, okay, it, it was probably a bear. and by the time we got all calmed down and and stuff like that we made our dinner and it got uh, dark and and we had uh, kerosene you know the white gas lanterns and um and we drank a few beers and had a few shots of whiskey and and um eventually we turned in and uh, we had flashlights in the tent <laughs> And I brought my 357 in the tent with me, and he brought uh, his 44. And we zipped the tent door down and, and talked a little bit and bullshit and and uh, rehashed, you know, the thing about uh, what he saw. And he said the same thing every time. And I says, well, it's probably a bear, you know. Um, and I told him, I says, you know, the best advice is around a bear or a cougar is, is he never run. Uh, they'll chase you probably, you know, it's a predator instinct thing. So uh, just don't run. Um, and uh, next time you bring your 44 <laughs> and put it on your holster. Okay. For, for, for stuff like this. And he goes, yeah, I think you're right. So eventually we fell asleep. 
and uh, where we had the tent, it was up against the woods and um, behind the tents where my head was, it was a steep downhill grade and it was pretty forested with evergreens and and ferns. And the tent was laying, the sidewall of the tent was laying against my face eventually just before I fell asleep and I could feel the tent, it was a slope and it was laying against my face, but I didn't care. It just uh, smelled like the woods and I was at home. And uh, so uh, sometime in the morning or, or the wee hours of the morning, like uh, one o'clock to uh, before light, you know, but it was, I think probably 1 a.m. or two o'clock in the morning. And I'm sleeping and I became aware of something. It, it, it was a hand and it was palm in my face. And at first I thought it was dreaming. And as I woke up more and more, it was pretty evident that a big hand was actually palming my face uh, through the tent. And that really frightened me because immediately I thought it was a bear. And maybe my friend was right, you know, it was a bear. But at any rate, I could feel the fingers and the thumb on my face. It was palm in my face, uh, just like a person would palm a basketball. And when I finally realized it wasn't a dream and it was real, man, I, I hollered, <laughs> jerked my head back, and I pegged my friend in the middle of the chest, you know, with my head. And he goes, what the you know what, what the hell's going on? And I says, I, I said, something's outside. It touched my face uh, through the tent. And he says, no shit. And I, sorry about that, but it, we both uh, grabbed our flashlights and pistols, unzipped the tent and we go scrambling out there. And uh, he was looking one way, I was looking uh, the other and, and we heard something really big i mean as big as an elk uh, running behind the tent downhill and it sounded like it was a two-footed being because it it wasn't the bounding of a deer and at that time there wasn't um hardly any elk up there cats all changed now there's a lot of elk up there but so it couldn't have been an elk it could have been a bear and I've heard lots of bears uh, crashing around in the bushes. And uh, so I I was clueless. I thought, what the heck was that? And my friend goes, you know, this is really creepy. He says, I don't think I want to stay here anymore. <laughs> and I thought, you know, okay. I says, let's just hang out um, and leave the lanterns on. I'll make his coffee and maybe have a donut or two and and we'll kind of figure out you know what the game plan is so <clears throat> about first light you know uh, we were apprehensive to go out and hunt um in that area and i says you know i i, I know of another place it's closer to monroe and it's on the opposite side of the valley let's go over there and uh, do some road hunting and and we did and, and we left and so that was the first time i had a weird situation that i think back now is it had a high likelihood of being a um it was a bigfoot but i did go back hunting in that area over the years but i always had a high power rifle with me and i had a 357 on on my um, holster and uh, uh and no more encounters up there um 
and at the time of that first encounter, I think it was, <clears throat> I was probably 26 years old. And uh, so I did a lot of hunting in the meantime. And um, I did have a situation up by uh, Clee Ellum, uh, Washington. Now, Clee Ellum is on Highway uh, I-90. Uh, Clee Ellum is a, uh, is a pretty cool little town and has your has your heading to the east on i-90 and you're on the highway and uh if you look off on your right which is probably to the south is a huge mountain range looking thing up there um and uh, I got to remember back, I, I think it's a unit, um, a number 336 or something. No, it's something different, but it's up there where uh, Fish Hook Flats is and all that. It's big elk area and a few deer and lots of bears. And we did a lot of, of hunting up there for elk with bow and arrow. And uh, it was really cool place. It was... Uh, in places it was brushy but other places it was a uh, semi-open but it was um you know big trees in areas up there the um uh, the uh the evergreens they had never been logged off at all and they were huge and it was really beautiful the colors of uh, of the leaved uh, trees you know uh, the oranges the yellows the reds and the smell of, of of the pines up there. And it was steep country and big park meadows, you know, way back in bowls and every, I guess people call them haulers, if you will. But it was just a really beautiful area. And we, uh, we hunted up there for 15 years for elk. And um, remember one day I was hunting uh, with a fourth, a third guy um to uh, join up with this and we hunted and fished uh for years uh, and um i remember this guy i went up there with in my truck uh, this guy is a really good steelhead fisherman i mean probably one of the best in the world and we fished with each other for for 25 years at least one day a week uh, for steelhead and a lot of times a couple times a week and um so i i i brought him in to this bow hunting and and deer hunting with rifle and he got him a few animals and he was pretty savvy um but this one day we went on this road that goes to a feature of land up there called a P.O. Point. And uh, uh, we parked my truck there and, and then we ventured down a hill into an area that was uh, kind of swampy at the bottom. And it was pretty brushy and we were bow hunting and I had the elk bugle <clears throat> and I had a cow call and uh, we go down there and we set up and then I used the bugle to locate a bull because a lot of times, you know, they would bugle back, but a few times it was another hunter, right? So it, it was uh, kind of hard to tell the difference because uh, hunters got uh, really good at that bugle. So it was hard to tell. And uh, anyway, a bull uh, responded and he was in the bottom down there. And and, and we'd been uh, chasing this group of elk for, I don't know, at that point, uh, four or five days. And uh, they would never leave that area down there. It was brushy and uh, they were uh, pretty much uh, behaving um, uh, just like the caginess of a whitetail deer. A white tail buck, you know. I 
I've, I've, I've literally almost stepped on the back of huge white tail buck and have them just fly up out of the brush and it'll just scare the crap out of you. <laughs> I've, I've seen people step on a white tail buck and we were in the drive line and pushing them to the shooters. And I remember this one guy, a young guy, and he, he literally stepped on, on this white tail buck about a three by three or hand eye guards that would make it a four by four, or I guess you guys in the East would call it an eight point. And that buck jumped up, knocked my friend down, and I was only 20 feet away. And that buck it jumped up, ran off, and I could have shot it, but it was it wasn't a safe thing because I knew where the people were. So I just laughed and I just watched it. And I says, "You okay?" He says, "Oh yeah, I'm fine." And uh, so that is the kind of stuff these elk were doing, okay, up there. And so we just uh, chase them around in the bushes, and they and they'd walk around us in a circle and and all that. And, uh, well, we never did get a shot on that group of elk. And there was probably 15, I don't know, 16 elk in there. And uh, so we go all the way to the bottom. And we we started to uh, slowly um, hunt out a, a, a patch of bushes. and in large trees and there is a creek there beside us and we were split up about i don't know 20 yards apart and just walking real uh, slow and and quiet and i was using the cow call every once in a while and uh we hear this uh, group of animals uh, running from behind us towards us um and we froze and where I froze was on a game trail and it was running perpendicular to where we were um, in our walking, okay? And I could see down this game trail long ways and, and my friend was standing at the edge of it and immediately we knew the animals weren't as large of an elk, but uh, it probably deer. And eventually we saw these deer and as they came across the clearing and the game uh, trail, they came like individually, you know, spaced apart. And these animals were breathing hard. They were scared as hell and their tongues were hanging out of their mouth. And they were dripping in mud and water. It was the weirdest thing I ever seen in my life. And their and the ears on those animals were just uh, laid out out flat across the back of their head. You know, like when they are are running or scared or something, and they angle their ears back. And uh, and one of them came and stood pretty close to us it had seen us and i think it was kind of looking for protection and i thought i bet you i bet you pack of coyotes are are hunting these or maybe it's a cougar or it could be wolf because there was wolves up there and uh but then my friend and i we heard you know something was coming our way at first we thought it was that herd of elk you know we've been playing with but it sounded a lot bigger and it it was uh, two different animals uh, one was to the left of us and the other one was uh, to the right of us it sounded like uh, they were about 100 yards away and they were running and immediately it was obvious it was it wasn't an elk and whatever it was was on uh, two legs and they were they made a lot of noise and they weighed a lot and they ran towards us and it was almost as if uh, they knew that my friend and i were there and they stayed out of sight and ran around us 
and due to the feature of land and the thickness of of the brush and trees and stuff we never saw them but uh, they ran around us you know one to the left and the other one on the right and ran around us and uh, continued on down slope in that uh, ravine if you will and and all the noise quit and i said to my friend i says what the hell you think that was and he goes i don't know but whatever it was i'm sure that's what those deer were running from now this particular friend he told me of a story for years that uh, him and his little brother and and their parents were uh, headed from the Seattle area in their in their station wagon um, to Oregon to a family event. So it hit. Uh, this is what happened. Okay, my friend is driving the station wagon the parents had fallen asleep and he had uh, two brothers one brother was sitting in the passenger seat he was the youngest brother the oldest brother was in the back and sleeping all those guys are sleeping you know they were driving in in the dark hours and so my friend he says eventually we got at a place where on i-5 uh just past olympia a ways it got really foggy and they had to slow down and uh, put the headlights on low beam and uh, he said we're going you know like uh, 20 25 miles an hour and we came upon something in the middle of our lane on the freeway and he says it at first it looked like a tree was growing out of the freeway in the middle of his lane and as they got closer he says dan it was a sasquatch now my brother and i we both saw it our parents and our older brother in the back were asleep and it happened you know so fast i says how close uh, did you get and he says we got probably 30 feet away from it and it just stood there and stared at us and he says it was really tall and i says how tall and he says well not like i had anything to measure it with but it was uh, twice as tall as any any six foot man i mean it was up there and uh i said what happened and he says well it it just stood there and it was breathing and it was looking at us you know the chest was moving and some stuff and then he says it ran up the bank to their right and disappeared up a steep steep bank and he says the fog was thick but we could see in the area where this thing ran up the hill and he says dan it it took about three or four strides and it was gone and it ran as fast as a deer or elk would run i mean it was just up that hill lightning speed and was gone and and i says your little brother saw it too and he says yep oh man so you know over the years i fished with his little brother and and this friend of mine and we talked about that and um he uh his little brother says yeah it it i was right there it happened and so yeah that was interesting now um okay so i'll tell you about the time i was elk hunting with bow and arrow to the east of enumclaw washington you go up to a town called uh green green something green i i think it's green bar or something uh at any rate it's green something and it's it's like basically it's on the map has a town but it's just basically uh a couple stores there and it's grown up a little bit oh it's called a uh, green water yeah green water so it's real small and literally if you blink you're gonna miss that thing but they have beer and and burgers and and stuff like that there and that's on highway 410 so if you're heading east on 410 and you pass uh through greenwater and uh 
you start looking up up the road you go about i don't know within 10 miles maybe it's five is forest road number 70 and uh you go uh, left on that on that road and it'll take you all the way up to uh to a place they call government metals and uh it is a popular place that uh, people go up there hunting and stuff but um i think i think a large amount of the people go up there to get on this uh this uh, four wheel drive road is is called the manastash trail and it it goes for for miles you know and i've been on it with dirt bike a lot you know for for a lot of years we rode our dirt bikes up there because it was fun it was challenging uh and we go back in there 60 miles and we weren't even scratching the surface of of how many miles it's it's my understanding it goes all the way from um from Western Washington to Yakima. And it it's uh, basically is is a Jeep trail that uh, makes a circle all the way through a uh, Clay Elm area up at Fishhook, Fishhook Flats around in there. And there's a huge, a huge wilderness area in there. You know, it's just, it, it goes for, for hundreds of square miles. It's just, amazing and so i'm up there up the forest road 70 and i drive up there a few miles and uh there was a group of elk i'd been chasing and you turn off the 70 make a right on to one of the logging uh, roads um i can't remember the number of the road but i'm remembering on the on the map I was looking at I I got these detailed maps of the area. It was a four digit number and I think there was a 7 was the first and the number you know maybe it was a 7028 or something like that. And I drove back in there and it was at first light and I saw a couple bucks up uphill from me I running along a ridge and I remember that they were both uh, nice black tail bucks. You know, one was a three point, the other one was a four point. I guess, you know, uh, three points and one eye guard is a three point in my book, but I just uh, give me an idea what these were. But it was interesting. I watched them guys a while and uh, they already had spotted me and they were running. So I had no shot. And but I didn't care. I was elk hunting, so I went all the way to the end of that so uh, that uh, dirt uh, road, you know, gravel road. And there was a landing up there where they had uh, pulled the trees to, and and there was a big slash pile there. I parked my truck and uh, get on my backpack, and you know, got all my supplies in there: water, food, I got rope knife sharpener flashlight etc you know everything you need and hand rubber gloves <laughs> and so um i put everything on and i had i had a nine millimeter um on me handgun and uh it was in it was in it was on a hip uh holster and i was full cameled out and everything i was in really good shape too i i was i was 30 years old and so i uh i hiked in there about a mile and a half and then i get to a little bench that uh it leads you through some virgin timber timber at the bottom of government metals and if you were at the top of government metals and look into the south you'd be looking at mount rainier you know as the crow flies i'm sure rainier in a straight line was you know i um it's a big mountain so i don't remember looking on a map and measuring the distance but certainly within five to seven miles away 
it's that close. The, it was open uh, in the area I was hunting. And uh, so I was at the bottom of Government Matters uh, Meadows uh, all the way to the bottom of the creek down there. It winds around down there. And then if you cross the creek and then you went uphill a few hundred yards, that's where I was. But I had approached it to, from a different road. Uh, it's quite a walk. I mean, it'd be stupid to walk downhill from Government Meadows, because, you know, because it's just way too far. So I'm over there. I found the shortest way in there. And so I'm up there. I'm walking real slowly inside the timber. And, and underneath me, it, w it had been logged off a few years before and either either the trees grew back by themselves or they were planted i'm not sure but i, I would think if it was if it was planted that they would have done a better job of that because it seemed like it wasn't so so thickly populated with the new jack firs coming up but uh, they were all about i don't know 10 feet tall or so and um I just recognize that, you know, I, I don't know why I had thought that, you know, beforehand and what happened, what follows. So I'm cow calling and eventually I get a cow call back. And and that's pretty normal. I I was expecting that. So the group of elk was there. Now I had the wind on him. And at that time, it was probably 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was in the shadow of, of the mountain. And uh, it was a beautiful bluebird day, beautiful sky, but I was in the shadows. And so I just kept uh, sneaking in closer and closer. Now, if you've ever hunted elk before, uh, you know that, uh, if you're following a herd of elk and they're walking, you'll never catch up to them because their legs are so long, they just walk away from you. It's only when they're getting ready to bed down or something or they're doing their socializing thing or they're, or they're feeding, you know, maybe got a bull that's, that's uh, getting amorous because he kind of hangs around there and uh, corrals them. And uh, he's just waiting for for each of those uh, females to to uh, come in to being ready to breed with, you know, so they could could hold up at that point. And that's what was going on. I, I was able to get close and eventually I started seeing elk and I could see him. And they had no clue that I was there, Miguel, none at all. And I was just going, well, well, this will be good. I got my grunt tube. Um, I got my cow call. And to be honest with you, I was going to stick a cow if I had a chance. And because I love the meat, you know, elk meat, a little better than deer. But it is a real hassle getting one out, especially if you're alone. And I've done that. That's just insane. So I get up closer and eventually i could see him a little bit uh, down slope from me about i don't know 75 yards away that's too far for a bowl i had a compound bowl but still too far and uh i saw i saw a couple raghorn bulls which we you know is a younger bull in my book you know raghorn is a term that I've heard for the old, old elk hunters call a bull that has grown so old, it's beyond its prime. And its horns, you know, become uh, freakish and look like tree stumps. But how I use the term uh, raghorn uh, uh, for me is a younger bull, you know, that's like a three point, you know, um, a bigger than a spike. So I see a couple of these raghorns down there and and they're kind of like uh, a mind in their manners and the cows. There's I think that whole herd of elk was. Probably 20 elk, you know, it, 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 I mean, 15 or 20, you know, maybe a little bit more. 
And then eventually I see the big bowl and it, it's, it's like a five by six and the horns are really big. Um, and he's the one who's, who's the boss, right? The herd. So I kind of thought, you know, he is further away and behind the group of cows and the raghorns and the only way i'm going to get a chance at him because at that point i really wanted him and uh i'd have to watch these guys bed down which they always do and you know while they're bedded down and chewing their cud all i got to do is position myself uh keep the wind in mind not be seen and make no noise but it was it was fairly damp you know, ground was uh, silent walking and everything. So I just waited and watched them. And eventually they just uh, slowly meandered over, over, over the edge of the feature of land. And I figured that uh, pretty soon, you know, they would bed down. So I slowly snuck down there once the last elk had gone over the hill. And uh, I sneaked down in there. And I'm getting to a point where pretty soon I got to worry about if they just bedded down over the top of the rise, but I was thinking they probably went to a deeper and maybe laid in the timber because elk are pretty smart. You know, they'll go lay down in the timber or high brush and, and disappear because they're laying down. So I got cautious and I thought, uh, have I waited enough time? and I remember looking at my clock and it was like on my wristwatch it was i think it was before 11 o'clock in the morning but almost 11 and uh i gave him a few more minutes and then i just walked on down the hill out of the timber and i was walking in those those uh jack firs in that uh, previously logged off area and the trees were all uh, 10 foot or so tall uh, i'm looking for brown you know just i'm looking for the color brown and i i'm using my binoculars and just my naked eye as well and eventually i see brown and i go i looked at it and i go well oh, that's a weird color elk you know because over here in western washington uh, the elk are are chestnut brown a little bit like on the back you know chestnut brown and and the hind legs in the front a quarter manes are usually pretty dark and and the bellies are more like a buckskin uh, color um and the back of their legs it has a stripe on it a black stripe and some white fur that a lot of times you'll find orange color of of that fur on their back legs so it's pretty distinctive if you see the if you see those colors it's an elk but this was just one color and it was uh it was a grayish brown you know weirdest thing i ever saw and i go i wonder if that's a bear so i i put my binoculars on it and what I saw, it it literally changed my life because it I I wasn't prepared, I wasn't uh, thinking about it, and here was a big Sasquatch. He was, and I say he. I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, he was standing behind a huge blow down a, a tree, you know, and. Probably the tree's diameter was, you know, five foot across, and it was laying down. And it, and the hill, it was sloping downward from me to him, and the tree was laying on this. So he's standing behind this blowdown, so he's at a lower elevation than uh, the tree is at. You know, he's standing there, and he's just looking right at me. And all I could see was from the waist to the top of his head, and I could see his whole torso 
and head uh, real clearly. I had eight power binoculars, which brought him up really close, and he was probably 65 yards away. And I can remember that it's like, he just thinking back at this, imagine like how disturbing it would be to a person to see a space alien for the first time. I've never seen any of that, you know, but if you did see one, imagine how much it would up, up, uh, upset your psyche. I mean, to, to, to uh, see that, it was upsetting. And it, it uh, took me a while to, to really, you know, realize I wasn't dreaming. It was real. And I started shaking because it was actually quite frightening. But then I shook that off because I, you know, it could be life or death. And this thing, it was as tall as those jack firs in that whole metal, which puts him at, at, at least at 10 feet tall. And I have heard other people uh, talk about, you know, sightings of Sasquatch and, and they say, oh, it's uh, shoulders were four feet across or five feet across. And, you know, I, I, I had no way to measure any of that. But, you know, believe me, I was really studying every feature of its body I could see. And I'm sure, I'm sure you know, the distance or the shoulder width was every bit of four feet. It uh, could have been even five. I wouldn't have known, but it was wide. It, it, it was, it was, it was as big as a brown bear. I mean, you know, what was standing before me was as big as an adult, big male brown bear. And it was really frightening. Um, and its muscles were huge. It, didn't have much of a neck, but it it had like, you know, the trapezoid muscles. You know, I was a weightlifter for years. Um, it's those muscles that uh, uh, feather off your neck and run in to your shoulders. You know, on the top of your shoulder, and those muscles on him were just. I mean, that's all there was as far as a neck, and um, huge chest long arms that actually disappeared behind the tree because a bolt of his arms were along his body along the side and hanging down so i didn't have the opportunity to see how long his arms were in relation to his knees but uh, his muscles and his arms are just you know what i could see was huge you know he, i'm pretty sure his 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 biceps and tricep area if you if you measure that it i mean it was it was as big as my waist and um his chest muscles were pronounced uh he wasn't real real hairy um and i could see the hair on his head being blown around uh, by the slight breeze and he was blown for me to him I could see the glint in his eyeballs. I could see him blink. Um, his lips were were thin. Um, his mouth was kind of wide. His jaw was pretty rugged. He had uh, cheekbones, not much hair on his face other than uh, just like uh, a beard, if you will. But the beard wasn't very long. I mean, it was only like uh, two or three inches um he had a little bit of a mustache but not much his nose was wide um he was a human looking nose uh he had no hair from uh, basically the top of his upper lip uh, other than the wispy mustache no hair from there to to the top of his forehead but he had had longer hair on his head and i could still see he had ears and they were just like a human ear roundish and flat laying across her 
or tight against his head and and the back of his head it looked like i never saw the back of his head but it it uh, looked like the hair got a lot longer and i continued on down the the back of what uh, could have been his neck if you will and his shoulders were pretty um hairy and his arms were kind of hairy but not very long and uh his eyes were just as black as anything i i, I saw no whites of his eyes but uh, he's just looking right at me and uh and from looking at its face i could tell it was a male it just has a look i mean i um you know the difference between the face of a woman and the face of the man right yeah yeah and so it was a male and what i saw it was pretty fascinating and uh, this this guy he was actually handsome i've heard i've heard other other people report it looked like the devil and it was the ugliest thing i've ever seen in my life and that no this thing was peaceful looking and it was handsome in the face and he looked very stoic, but really a secure in who it was as as a being. I mean, it's him. It, it looked like it, it had been around the block a long time, but still looked healthy, in good shape. It definitely it definitely wasn't starving for food, and uh, so we watched each other for probably five minutes and my compound bow it got heavy in my left arm or my left hand i was holding it and the binoculars in my right hand i wanted to lay down my bow um i had a hoyt bow made by hoyt and uh it was it was made for metal you know um and fiberglass limbs that bow i still have it and it's it it's a 90 pound ball and i had it back down to 80 85 pounds i could not even pull it back now it's just way too much and he was a heavy ball so i marked in my mind and the binoculars and i looked back down with my eye and he's still there looking at me and i kneeled down and and I took my eyes off him. I laid my bow down, slowly stood back up. I looked back down, and he was gone. At which point, I was bewildered. How can he just do that? What, what's what's going on? So, I scoured the area with my eyes. Um, I did pull my nine millimeter out, and I thought, boy, this is really stupid. I should have brought my three fifty seven. And so I thought that, you know, maybe this guy was coming up the hill and sneaking up on me. And I, I got kind of terrified um, because how big it was, you know. Um, so I stood my ground. I stood there and I says, well, there's an area that if he's coming for me, he's got to cross and I will be able to see him. I mean, the chipmunk would be able to go across that without me seeing it. <clears throat> and he never came and um you know uh later when i got out and i, I kept thinking about this and i thought why did he do that and i uh, i think the nearest i can figure out is he had seen me before and then i came back because i'd been hunting that area for for a couple of years you know I think he was telling me that, hey, these these elk are my groceries, if you will, and you just get the hell out of here because he stood up uh, directly in between me and where those elk had gone. So, you know, he was definitely blocking me. And, you know, I I told my buddies about this later and they says, well, why didn't you go down there and look for footprints? And I thought, I said, I said, you gotta be stupid. 
if you saw just how big this was, yeah, I'll just mosey on uh, down there and hope he's gone. All they got is this not is this nine millimeter. I thought that'd be a fool's errand. So I got back out of there. I had I don't know. I think about a three mile hike and total out of there from the place that he jumped up at. And I had a lot of places where I, um, real brushy and you got to get on your hands and knees, you know, to get out and underneath this stuff and stand back up. And the whole hike out, I was terrified. I thought I was dead, but I thought I was going to get to grabbed at any time, you know, and, but I remember looking down the hill and I saw my truck on the road and I was within a hundred yards and I thought, man, I just hope I get out of here. And I did put my bowl in the truck and uh, I split. I went home. I never went back there for ever. And, um, but I did hunt hunts above government medals with uh, 300 Winchester Magnum. I took my son in there hunting a few times, but I never went back to that one place uh, where that Bigfoot stood up on me. And, and that is the only one I've actually seen with my eyes. So I know without a doubt that uh, Bigfoot is a real creature, is physical. And in this case, it was just a really a uh, large, stoic, peaceful looking animal. But I, you know, I think, I think they're more human than animal or something in between. But, you know, the face and what body I was able to see from the waist up, it was uh, definitely human. The face was, was, it, I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, uh, the face they saw looked like a monkey. Well, yeah, this wasn't a monkey. And there wasn't much hair on the face. And the color of the of the skin was like a grayish brown. I saw wrinkles in its face. You know, um, so I told people at work about it and. I was an engineer, I was an aerospace engineer for 34 years, and I was dealing with, with a lot of really smart people and worked with those guys for years, and I told them about it, and they believed me. Um, but we all decided that I shouldn't be talking about it at work. <laughs> That's, yeah, you're probably right. So I stopped talking about it at work because, you know, first thing you know, your manager is going to think you're a wingnut and then you don't get those special projects. Right. So. Um, so I was I was about uh, 30 years old when that happened. And uh, uh, since then. Um, i had done a lot of hunting, but I, I laid down the bow and arrow. Um, and the reason was, is, is from what I saw at uh, that one big foot. And I figured there is no way I'm going to be running around, you know, with the bow. And for a while I was just, I was packing a 357 along with my bow. And I did that for years, but I thought, you know, all this is really cumbersome. And so I just started using high power rifle and, um, uh, I took a, I took a guy, uh, steelhead fishing. A guy was working on our property. I had our property logged off. And this guy was, you know, a uh, pretty a longtime logger. He ran a uh, uh, large machinery, excavator, crane, bulldozer. For a long time, the guy was a log truck driver. Uh, just a really good old guy. I still know him. I still take him fishing for trout at a lake that is not many miles away. He's pretty good fishing for trout, and he's he's 88 now. But um, I took him uh, a steelhead fishing for a number of years when uh, he was he was uh, 63, and I was about 42, and I was in real good shape then. 
and uh so we go deer hunting and fishing and stuff and uh, he told me of a story that uh he was hunting up in the north uh, central part of washington state um um around mazama the methow valley i think that's how it's pronounced but it's um, if you ever look at a map at the state of Washington, there is a wilderness area in in the central north part of the state of Washington. It's called the Pesaten Wilderness, and uh, it's horseback and hiking only, uh, no motorized vehicles allowed. And uh, it's it it uh, goes up on in to British Columbia, and it's a beautiful country. I've hiked in there. Um, I saw one huge buck up there, but I had no shot, but it's such a hike, you know, just getting in there that it's just, I mean, you're not going to do that. And then you shoot something, then you got to pack it out. So, um, anyway, he tells me of a story that they went up, his father and his father's buddies, all those guys were loggers and they went up in there, um, up up a four-wheel drive uh, road that uh, we did eventually go up there and they hunted deer up there and they got you know big four points you know in in your count it would be it would be a 10 pointer okay big mule deer bucks he said one day that he was up there by himself you know as it was you know uh, their method of hunting it is they just uh, dispersed from camp and and they'd come back whenever and they'd go scale these big mountains and my friend um the older guy he he said he said dan i went up and he took me eventually to that same place um it was a huge metal and it was pr pretty much at the top of this mountain and um he said i was a little down slope from the mountain and the snow was like knee deep and he says he heard some screaming at the top of the hill and uh he said you know it it wasn't a mountain lion it wasn't a bear but it was the oddest of screaming and it was loud he says it was the oddest oddest uh, thing i've i've ever heard in my life <clears throat> and pete wasn't scared of nothing i mean the guy was was basically mountain man right yeah. So he gets up to the top and he sees these uh, tracks in the snow. He's not uh, quite on them, so he can't look down in the, in the snow to see what they are. But eventually he gets up there and he said, Dan, it was bare foot footprints. There was a small one. There was a medium sized one. And there was one that was really big. And I says, how long do you think the biggest one was? He says, probably 18 or 20 inches long. And he said, but I didn't measure him. I just looked at him, you know. Um, so he followed him. And they went down into, ho over the top of this of this mountain. And they went downhill into this, this canyon. And it was brush choked and a lot of big trees and really dark looking down there. And he said, you know, I just wanted to see if I could see whatever made these tracks. And, you know, he started going in there and he's got a 30 odd six in his hand. And at that time, you know, he killed a lot of big game. I scared of nothing. I mean, the guy, he shot uh, charging black bears and grizzlies and saved people's lives. You know, that's what this guy was all about. And, uh, so he says i started going down about another 100 yards and uh, something down in the very bottom of that uh, ravine in that heavy brush hollered and he says he was pretty sure it was hollering at him and he says it was frightening and he goes i just got the hell out of there <laughs> he said he, he just backed off that hill and uh, never hunted that uh, for the rest of the season other than adjacent hills around you know camp and stuff but there's another person i mean i trust this guy i've known him for for years and um uh, so yeah we'd go down um 
to a local river um, that you got to hike in about a mile and a quarter. And there's a section of this road that gets really steep. And um, and the walkout is is torture. But at that point, you know, I was tough. The Pete was tough. Well, Pete is his name, you know. Um, and uh, we go down there. We walk all the way down to the river, and um, I'm I'm gonna leave the name out of this river and where it was because here is a group of these these bigfoot that live there and they've lived there for years and they haven't haven't hurt me so i've i've heard from from lots of podcasts you know where landowner brings up you know that hey i saw some bigfoot or i'm having some problems with bigfoot and government agents uh, show up and then before long you know the land is locked up and or they shoot them you know, and I'm thinking, why shoot one? You know, if they're not hurting you, don't shoot them. We're down there fishing, and uh, I told, I told Pete, you know, all the all the honey holes, you know, that I I learned off one of my hunting and fishing buddies. That's the big steelhead guy, and boy, did we catch a bunch of steelhead. Um, and literally a lot of them as long as your leg. Okay, so I mean, I caught a number of steelhead, made a steelhead out of there that were 38 and a half inches long. A number of them in in the 36 inch to 38 inch, you know, like all the time. And a lot of those fish we let go, you know. And we did always uh, keep our limit if we could. But any other fish, you know, that wasn't hurt and it was early in the daytime, we just let them go. And you, uh, you're only allowed a couple steelhead a day, and there's a punch card, right? So, you know, sometimes a warden, I mean, the possibility of seeing a warden was low down there. It was in a canyon area. Um, and you had to hike along the bank, you know, for quite a ways to uh, fish all those holes. And uh, I remember a number of times that I had, I had a brush make a noise behind me. And I thought, what is making this noise? It sounds big. And uh, I thought, it's not elk because the lay of the land, it was below a bluff. And it kind of narrowed up there really tight. Now, it wasn't elk because elk are herd animals. I mean, where you find one elk, you're going to find more. And they usually, you know, travel in this neck of the woods uh, travel in uh, groups that you know 12 to as much as 25 i've heard a little bit higher so i knew he wasn't an elk but it was making as much noise as an elk it wasn't a deer it was too small it could have been a huge black bear because there was black bears up there but i i'd always be standing on this one big rock and fish off this rock i knew it was a huge rock um, you could stand one person on the top of it and get a pretty good view of the hole down there. And you were standing always in the shadows so the steelhead wouldn't see you. But it was fun to hook a fish off that thing because the water was so clear and you could see the whole fight of the fish and everything. It was, it was spectacular. So at that point, I was, say, 42, 43, and five. And I was well aware of Sasquatch at that point, but I'd only seen that one, and I've only seen one in my life. And so one day I was fishing by myself, which a lot of times I did. I'd get off work at uh, 2.30, I'd rush home, I'd have all my fishing stuff all laid out, I'd strap on my 357, and I'd go. And I would park at the top, of this uh, road it was gated and locked and you got to get out you know park right there and then and, and then you just head west and walk on this uh, gravel road well the gravel road it goes down to a fish hatchery 
and it's a salmon hatchery now. And, and they raise, uh, I think they're raising uh, Chinook. That's a king salmon. And then you'd be at the bottom at the hatchery, and then you keep keep walking further, and there is the river. And uh, so I'd start fishing there. I'd be down on the river about 4.30, and uh, I had plenty of time to fish. You know, I think a lot of times I was there probably before 4 o'clock. And I remember I'd always wait until 5 o'clock or 5.15, uh, and I'd always make sure to be down at this one hole that uh, it, it had a huge ledge going along the far bank. And it was a deep hole. At the top of the hole was a huge rock. I don't know where that rock came from. I mean, it would have had to roll into there from from up slope, but I'd always thought, you know, where'd this big rock, you, you know, come from? I mean, it was as big as a bus, right? And the fish would stack up on the far uh, ledge, and you'd be standing on on top of the big rock, and you'd cast to the ledge and let your eggs go down there. I was using a salmon eggs. From the salmon I would catch in the salt water, and and there's a big uh, sack of eggs in the female fish, right? And also in the winter time, you know, we'd catch a female seal head with big skein eggs in them, we called them, and we'd split them open and, and make bait out of those things with borax. So anyway, I'm down there. I would get there at five o'clock or five uh, fifteen at this one hole, and that is always when the fish would start biting and at that point it'd just be uh, you could catch you know six or eight or nine fish out of that one hole i was just letting go but i'd keep one and then i'd walk back up stream because then the light would get off of the water and then those fish would start biting and then i'd catch a few more and towards when it was you know, getting uh, towards the end of the day, I'd always keep one, and then I'd have my two fish limit, and then I'd hike out of there. So, um, and I did that for years. I I got a lot of steelhead there, and so this one time I was there, I I had fished all the way to to dark, and all by myself. And I no flashlight, but I had a full moon. I cleaned my fish there and uh, I stood up. I put uh, both of those fish. Those fish were like um, probably 10, 11 pounds, which would be a 31 inch fish or 32 inch fish. And I was holding those in my left hand, in my fingers. And then I was holding my rod in my in, in my right hand, and I started walking out of there. And I get the first part of this road is pretty steep and windy. Yeah, and you got to stop a couple times, especially when you're carrying uh, twenty pounds of fish and, and your vest on. And you know, I wasn't wearing waders; it was in the summertime, so. I mean, I was wearing my wading shoes with the felt on the bottom. And so I'm hiking up out of that canyon on that road. And I get just before the crest of that. And I hear some big noise going on in, in the trees just to the right of me. And it startled me because I wasn't expecting anything. I mean, all those times I walk out of there by myself, you know, and I never, I never saw anything on the hike out, I, I seen a few uh, really nice bucks in there, but that was always on the hike in. And they were up on the flat instead of the canyon. And so I get up, I keep walking, and I'm thinking it's elk, because there is elk there. And my house isn't uh, too far away from that. I mean, as a crow flies, maybe, I don't know, three, four miles. And we're at the edge of, of these watersheds that um, 
disappear to the east and they go all the way uh, through that uh, Cleelum area, uh, Yakima, you know, goes for, for, for a few hundred miles perhaps, you know, and it's a wilderness back in there. So I'm thinking that's why Sasquatch is there because there's all these game animals. I mean, we have elk in our yard. We have deer in our yard. We've had bear in our yard. Um, we have seen uh, cougars in our yard. Um, um, and we got a lot of wildlife. So I'm thinking that's why those Bigfoot are, are living there. But anyway, so I keep walking and whatever it is or was was making noise it was following me but it was just inside the tree line and whatever it was was two-legged um it was an elk at a point i determined it's not an elk it's not a bear and i go you know it's probably another bigfoot at that point I, i i actually became a little scared because i remembered back how big that was for that Bigfoot I saw and whatever was following alongside on the gravel road in the timber to my right was big. It was making a lot of noise. And whenever I stopped, it would stop. And I'd start walking up and then it'd start walking. And at that point, I had my rod in my right hand with the two fish and I had my 357 out and I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I just started talking to it. I think more along the lines, you know, to keep me calm, but I was talking, I says, Hey, uh, you know, I know you're in there. I don't want any problems. I don't, I don't want to hurt you. And I hope you don't hurt me. And I said, I got a gun. And if I got to use it, I'm going to shoot you right in the up and head. So you best leave me alone. You might kill me, but I'm going to hurt you bad. And uh, and we were having this, con- or I was having this conversation, and this thing was walking along me as we went along. And I, I had to walk from the crest of that hill to the truck at the lock gate. It's a good uh, three quarters of a mile. If it was a mile, I wouldn't be surprised, but I've never measured it, but it followed me all the way out. And what was really disturbing is every once in a while, it would stomp a a tree, you know, a few years ago, a while ago, it had been logged in there or, or trees had fallen down, but, um, you know, sometimes we go in there and look for mushrooms. So we had to uh, see what the forest uh, looked like. And there was a lot of downed trees back there, about, you know, four and five inch diameter. And they were just laying down across each other back there. And that is the kind of stuff this thing was walking through. And every once in a while, it would stomp and break to one of those uh, trees laying down and it would snap hard and it it would stomp his foot all the way through the tree and in her foot would hit the ground hard I could feel the vibration in my feet up my legs and into my chest and I estimate that that thing was was within probably 40 feet of me the whole way out and it was so dark in there i could see nothing but i did have the moonlight over my head i was able to walk out of there and it was stomping and making a noise all the way out i never heard it it verbalized anything um i don't remember uh, hearing it breathe um but i was pretty terrified but i stayed cool and i made it all the way to the truck and I put I put the fish in the fish box in my canopy of my truck, I came my fishing rod in, and then I walk around to the front of my truck, I open the door, and I had my 357 in my hand, and I was leaning over the top of my truck. It was a Toyota four-wheel drive pickup at, at that time. 
And I said, are you still there? And I paused and then it just crashed to the west away from me. It sounded like a moose, you know, running away. And so I got my truck, I came back, I told my wife about it. And she goes, man. So the next week I go down there and I was fishing by myself. And I think it was a Saturday or something. And I go all the way down there to the same place. And I fish in, I fish in what we call the crick hole. <clears throat> it's right there where the hatchery dumps in. And there's a little creek that feeds that hatchery pond. And then it, it eventually dumps in to the crick hole in the main river there. And for years, it's, it's been a good place to fish. It's kind of filled in a little bit, you know, differently now. But it's where the fish come to because the hatchery is right there. And, you know, back in the day, it was a steelhead hatchery, but they took and uh, changed it to uh, Chinook. I think that's what they're raising there now. And so I'm fishing there. I'm all by myself. Nobody's there. And um, beautiful day. And again, it's about, I don't know, 1030 in the morning. And I had one steelhead on the bank. It was about, I don't know, 10 pounds. Chrome bright. And I bled the fish. I conked it on the head and bled it. And I had it up on, on the bank at the edge of the water. And I'm standing in the water there. I, I was fishing to get my second fish. And uh, I'm in, in water that is just past my knees. You know, it's probably July, uh, first part of July. And I'm fishing there, and I hear all this commotion. It's coming down the hill behind me. And it sounds like a herd of elk. I mean, they're making that much noise or whatever it is. So I reel up. I pull my 357 out because I... I remembered the one, you know, just, just, you know, several days a week before it had followed me out. So I didn't know what I was dealing with. And I can hear what I believed was a bear and it was bawling. It was making a lot of noise. It was bawling. It did. It, it, and it was running at me. And. I never did identify if there was more than one animal, but you know, there was one for sure. And whatever it was, was balling and it was making a lot of noise and it was running at me. Got louder and louder and louder. And at this point I had my 357 pointed to the edge of the timber behind me at the bank of the river and out comes this black bear. And he's running directly at me. And he's probably, I don't know, 50 feet away. He may be 60. And I put the gun on him and I says, hey, bear, hey, bear. And he looked at me like I was a ghost. And he altered his course like uh, 45 degrees and went upstream and to the right of me. And jumped in the river, swam the river, and he's bawling the whole way. He crosses the river, gets out of the river, never shakes off, just tears up, kill up the bank and into the woods, and he's bawling the whole time and disappears. And I spin back around and I look at the woods, and I still got my 357 pointed at the woods. All I hear was silence. I could hear, I could hear the river noise and a slight wind noise and nothing ever came out. And this bear was a good 400 pounds, <clears throat> jet black bear in good health. And I thought, what would be big enough to scare this thing that bad? 
is it another bear? If it was, I would, I would, I would uh, think, you know, the other bear would be right behind it, but uh, nothing ever came out. So, uh, I kind of chalked it up to maybe uh, Bigfoot was having some fun and games with the black bear. I, I don't know. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, so, you know, I I continued to fish that area for, I don't know, another 10 or 15 uh, years. And I did have uh, three different times where uh, something was following me out. Um even in the middle of the day and i've heard uh, trees get pushed down and uphill from me and i figure they're just letting me know they're still there and um i i told my um hunting and fishing buddies about it and he says why don't you just uh, go up the hill and uh, try to find the tree they pushed down and i says right <laughs> what what would i be so stupid to do something like that for <laughs> I don't have a death wish, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm leaving them alone and they're leaving me alone. But uh, uh, the last uh, time I had, had that happen with the tree being pushed down, I took a friend uh, down there. He's 70 years old and I'm 65 at that, you know, of last year. In November is my birthday. So uh, next November, I'll be 66. But we go down there and boy, the hike down and out really killed us, you know, because we're, we're not active. Uh, the COVID thing, it's uh, really screwed up, you know, being able to work out at the gym. And, you know, I worked out at the gym uh, three or four times a week for, for, for decades. And because the COVID thing, well, that wasn't happening. And, you know, you get lazy, I guess. And, and then I retired and, you know, I, I was doing a lot of projects around the house. So the hike out of there, it was uh, uh, pretty rough, you know, for us. Uh, more rough on me than him. But I heard a big tree get pushed down up slope. And I said to my fr uh, friend, I says, hey, did you hear that? And he goes, uh, what? And then I remembered he has a hearing aids, one in each ear. And I says, screw that. Of course he didn't hear anything. So I never brought it up. But I knew it was just, you know, the Bigfoot in the area let me know that they're still there. So that was uh, June of last year. So 2022. And that was the first week of June because that's when this uh, river, it opens up uh, to fish for steelhead. So that is, is my experiences with one Bigfoot for sure. And then all those other other things were strange occurrences. But that one that pawned my head uh, through uh, the tent wall was definitely freakish. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing your encounters and experiences with me. And if you're ready, I have some questions built up for you. Sure. You bet. Okay. Let, let's go back to your first encounter when you and your friends were camping and you felt the giant hand feeling your head. Why do you think the Sasquatch came up to the tent and started feeling around? I don't know, but, um, and again, it was just uh, me and one other friend of mine. And, um, you know, I've, um, uh, you know, because I've had these experiences and I, I still like the woods. Um, I'm always uh, curious and I watch programs like yours, you know, um, I watch these things because I'm, I'm curious, you know, what's out there and what are people seeing? And I've heard people talk about, you know, being in a tent. Um, I remember a story on one of these podcasts, this guy was telling a story. He's up there in one of those little one man uh, tent, you know, long, uh, you know, it's not high in one area of the tent and the other hairy area of the tent it's higher and the fabric is kind of clear and he's up there camping by himself and in the moonlight he could see this bigfoot a shadow standing where the shadow was cast across the tent and the bigfoot 
put his hand out and push the tent down to within inches of this guy's face. Now, why does a Bigfoot, you know, do that? Have no clue. You know, maybe it's a curiosity thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, it could have killed that guy. And that one that was palm in my face, I mean, if you put your hand up to your face and uh, try to palm your face um, just for scale and uh, get your uh, right hand index uh, finger uh, pretty much at the upper part of your scalp and your and your three fingers underneath it and then reach around and grab the opposite uh, side of your head. Now, my hand only covers half of my head but this hand it covered from the top of my head to my jaw at the bottom and on one side was fingers the other side was only one finger which makes it a thumb and why they did that i don't know curiosity yeah and do you think it was the same creature that your friend spotted on the forest road before he came running I back do. Do or or one in the group because from what i have heard from these podcasters and who have experience with this you know that bigfoot is rarely alone so it it was it could have been the same one or another member of that of that group yeah, and when you guys both got up, you could hear the creature crashing down through the woods, and it sounded bipedal. Yeah, once we got open the zipper, and the zipper like makes a lot of noise, and that's when we heard the crashing started, and and we get out with our flashlights, and we heard the crashing, and it was close; it was within probably twenty yards of us, and we could hear the crashing for you know for a long time, you know maybe as far as a hundred yards away and it was crashing away from us but uh between us us getting our our sneakers on you know slipping them on um and not lacing them up just getting shoes on and and then opening the zipper up which made a lot of noise and scrambling out there it was already realized we were getting up and coming out and it 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 split and we heard it and it was bipedal for sure yeah and you know if they wanted to kill you guys they easily could have so they were being gentle right yeah okay. i think so so it seems like all your encounters revolve around elk hunting or just hunting and fishing in general right i've heard i've heard from from one of the podcasters we both know about uh, you and I um, he has gotten a lot of emails from people who've had these encounters with Bigfoot while they were hunting elk and uh, so I don't know maybe the elk is their is their desired uh, target you know for eating because the meat is really good and it's a bigger animal so you know maybe that's why they've had uh, more of these of these uh, situations while hunting elk. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. The elk will be pushed and pressured into areas that don't have any human scent or pressure. And yeah. I think that's where the Sasquatch want to be. And like you said, they want to follow the food source. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard that, that a lot of encounters um, have happened in the berry patches. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, Fred Roll mm -hmm. up, up in Alaska. And he, 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 he has a bunch of stories, you know, that he reads, you know, he goes out and actually interviews these people in person and then come back and uh, tells a story. And uh, he's got a lot of stories of local people up in Alaska and also Native Americans that uh, say that they've had had encounters a lot in their efforts for picking berries. Well, yeah. that's one of the food sources of, of Bigfoot. Yeah, I've heard a lot of um, stories with Sasquatch <laughs> and berry patches actually in Washington State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Fred yeah, is uh, I, the one that got us in contact, so a big shout-out to Fred from Subarctic Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah, 
he's he's a great guy we talk on the phone he's a great guy yeah um you know uh, one thing that that i have heard um you know there's a lot of people who seem to see to to see what they call um a bright light or orb if you will um floating around in the timber just before they have an encounter with Bigfoot. Um, there is is a guy, I forget his name, he's an old guy now, but in uh, Northern California, these guys had been hunting up there on horseback for years. And they, they had encounters with Bigfoot and they saw these orbs um, and they were floating around in the woods around their camp up there in the wilderness. And they made recordings. I think it's called the Sierra Sounds. Um, mm-hmm. They were were visited regularly by Sasquatch at night. And the Sasquatch would be off in the woods and making these noise. And they got these recordings of it. And it's pretty disturbing. Um, yeah, I've I, heard it before, I, the Ron Moorhead audio recordings. Wait, yeah. Uh-huh. And they call it the samurai talk, if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never heard anything like that. If I did, I think I'd I'd be really creeped out. Yeah. But I have I've seen one of those orbs. Um, years ago, I was at uh, North Bend, up the Spur Ten Gate Road, and we that road in the old days. It was open all the way from North Bend to the Skykomish River uh, up around Gold Bar area. And uh, you could drive this road. It was about a 35-mile drive. Beautiful drive, man. Lots of fishing and hunting opportunities up there. Uh, Lots of lakes with bass in it and trout. A north fork of the Snoqualmie River was up there. And it was a fabulous uh, fishing river for trout. and all of the mountain uh, roads were open up there. Um, and we hunted up there a lot. I killed a lot of deer up there. And um, this one night I had had four wheel drive up in to um, an area we call uh, Lake La Catrine. There's a lower Lake La Catrine and an upper Lake La Catrine. And then in at the base of the mountain is is a Sunday lake. So there was a mountain up there that was right above a Sunday lake, and it was to the west. And there is a four wheel drive road that went up there, and I would go up there in my jeep. And so I was the first one in there. I went in on a Friday morning. One of my hunting buddies was going to meet me there and bring his dad, and then we'd hunt the weekend, and then we uh, had to get back for work and and me for college, right? And so I'm up there all by myself, up a four wheel drive road that only only a crazy person would drive up, but I did. I had a good Jeep. It was a Jeep uh, pickup. It was a J four thousand Gladiator. And um, so I'm up there, I'm camping. I had my dinner, I drank a couple beers, and I, I had a canopy on the truck. And I just uh, crawled in the back of my truck and got my sleeping bag. And during the course of the night, I had to wake up and go pee. So I crawled out of the canopy and I just walked over at the edge of the road there. I started peeing. It was a beautiful night. Stars out and everything. And I was, it was, I mean, I was all alone and I was in the middle of nowhere. And here comes this green round ball of light. It comes at the head of the valley. It comes down the valley. Uh and goes underneath me to the ravine that, you know, hopefully I'm going to be shooting my buck at in the morning at first light. 
it stops there underneath me and it's probably i don't know a couple hundred yards away and then it goes it stopped there for a while and i got through a pan and i was watching this and i go what is that i had no explanation and then it went directly away and up a mountain over the top and i never saw it again yeah. and i had no bigfoot encounter after that but uh i saw one and i i have i have no explanation what it was but i saw it yeah that is interesting and i appreciate you mentioning that the encounters were revolved around the elk hunting, but you also mentioned that a lot of them took place when you were alone. Yeah, yeah, and mostly alone. Okay. Let's but, focus but, on your main encounter sighting. If you could, do you remember the shape of the head? Could you describe that? And yeah, could I you do. go yeah. back into the facial features? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I've heard a lot of people talk about a conical shape head, but uh, this wasn't like that at all. It uh, looked like the typical uh, picture that does, and and an artist had made uh, about representation of Neanderthal man. It looked more like that, and there was no domed head. It was just. It's looked like Neanderthal man, and uh, maybe the top of the head was a little bit big, but I, I, I really never noticed any any cone shape at all, and I could see it real clear in my binoculars. So very and, manlike. Yeah, very manlike. Okay, and you said he looked confident. Oh yeah. Yeah. So Stoic. it seemed like he he was used to what he was doing. It, it's a routine for him and he was comfortable with it. Whatever he was doing, uh, he was comfortable. Um, he he had a peaceful look on his face. Uh, he didn't look angry. Uh, he just looked like neutral in the face, but had had the look on his face like uh, he was peaceful, he was confident, and stoic. I mean, and he did have wrinkles on his face, you know. Um, and it looked like he was he was past his middle age, if that's possible. But uh, he looked like, say, a human would look like by the time they're 55 or 60. Yeah. So and you know, he was older. The look, yeah. He was older for sure. But big, I'm sure that his weight was every, every bit of 900 pounds. He was just massive. Yeah. And you said his arms were like the size of your waist. They were. I bet you that guy. At a point in my life, I could I could curl with dumbbells 135 pounds, and that was my standard uh, workout. And the measurement around around my biceps and triceps was uh, 21 inches on both arms. I was a strong boy. I mean, I could bench press uh, 375 uh, free weights. That was my workout weight. And this guy, he he was uh, so much bigger. I wonder just how much uh, he could bench press or curl or lift up. I mean, it. it I bet you it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're benching trees out there. <laughs> oh man, and breaking those ones off. And and that's another thing. If 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 any of the listeners wanted to go up to uh, Cleallum. And uh, go up into those roads that lead up to P.O. Point and Fish Hook uh, Flats. I I think the Forest Service Road, uh, one of them that you can get on is Forest Road number 30 or 33, one of the two. And they'll bring you up into that area. The other road, it comes up from Cleellum and uh, traverses back and forth up, up the mountain. And you go over the top and you can get to Peel Point and all that. But on that slope of the mountains by Cleellum, 
towards Fishhook Flats is a road that goes along the rim up there. And if you get out of that thing and you go down slope, you're going to be seeing those uh, tree structures, you know, the teepee kind. Um, w- we saw a lot of those up there, and I was bewildered. I had no idea what I was looking at. And looking back now, I'm going, wow, there was a lot of those up there. Now, I don't know if they're still there. You know, that was over 30 years ago. Yeah. Or right there. Yeah, it was over 30 years ago. You mentioned the creature had ears. Now, that's not it typical did. with Bigfoot sightings. Can you um, describe the ears? The ears looked exactly like mine. Uh, I've got, I don't have big ears, and they're not small ears. It's just, and the shape of the ear, uh, it, it looked the same as a human's ear. And um i've heard other people who have reported on their findings and and what they have seen and they said that the ears were really small in compared to the size of the head but in this case it wasn't like that yeah that is interesting do you think the sasquatch was hunting the elk or do you think he was hunting you um well how predators work if they're hunting you, you'll never know it. It'll it'll just happen, and you'll die. Um, so you feel like I he have, cut you off from the elk? Absolutely. Yep. Now I you, think you had the wind that, in your face, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and his hair was blowing in in that uh, breeze, and uh, I could. He was. I was like a side wind of him at that point in a little, you know, the wind was had a 45, you know, between us, but it was, it was still blowing down slope, even though, you know, a lot of times as the day warms up, you know, the wind will start uh, coming uphill. It'll move uphill because uh, the currents are warming up, but it was still in that uh, condition there. I was I was partially in the shade, so it was still cool down there, and the wind was blowing across from right to left. So I still had the wind on him, but I could see the hair on his head being blown around by the wind. Yeah, so you got a but, really uh, good look at him with the binoculars. Oh, oh, yeah. It brought him right up, you know, 65 yards away. I had the eight power binoculars, and uh, it really brought it up close. Do you think the creature or the being waited for you to look away before he made his escape? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I'm sure they're pretty smart. I mean, I think he knew that he made his point. And I think he just ducked down because he just wanted out of that and was going to watch me from a different angle and see what I did. But I think I got the point. I mean, the elk hunt, at that point, it was ruined. Done. Yeah. (laughs) There's no way I was sticking around after that. Do you think there were more Sasquatch in the area than just him? Well, um, at that point in my life, I, I didn't know as much about Sasquatch and, and how they move around and all that. And at that point, I would have have thought it, it was it was just only one because I saw just only one. I never heard any noise, um, no hollering, no breaking branches, no thumping on trees. I've never heard any vocalizations in my life in the woods or banging on trees or or rocks being banged on each other. Um, I do remember that the guy who I fished with for steelhead uh, for years, he told me of a time that he was on that uh, one big uh, rock at the bottom of this hole. Um, Well, at this hole that has the big rock on on the top of it, um, he said that he had had times where he's fishing it all by himself 
and somebody's throwing rocks in the middle of the hole. And he says, he said, Dan, there, they, you know, nobody was there fishing. And I thought, who the hell, you know, obviously sees me fishing here. And then a, a big rock about as big as an orange or grapefruit, you know, lands in the middle of the hole. And he said he's had that, you know, happen a few times. But at that point, you know, we were so young. I mean, at that point, you know, we were like uh, 21 through 23, and we never even thought about about Sasquatch. And at that point, I had 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 uh, no had experiences with Bigfoot. You know, that uh, first one where I was in the tent and had it to grab my face, I think I was probably 27, you know. In 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 my middle twenties, um, and definitely before twenty nine. I mean, right in that area, you know, twenty seven or six. So, you know, I remember back, you know, so you know, maybe my friend was being visited by a Sasquatch and throwing rocks in the hole. Yeah, I know. And um, all these areas that you've had experiences and encounters in, is this the same county or? surrounding counties <clears throat> well so um the area along the river where i had the bear you know jump out of the bushes and and that that one sasquatch i think it was a sasquatch because uh, from what i heard well i'll just answer your question it was king county and then uh, up there along monroe I don't know how far Snohomish County goes, but it's potentially it could be up there. And then uh, down along where Greenwater is um, to the east of Enumclaw to that forest of Service Road 70 where the government metals is. I'm not sure what the county is there. It's, it could be Pierce. I'm not sure. Okay. What do you think the Sasquatch are, and how do you think they originated on this planet? You know, I, I've i heard a, a lot of different people talk. You know, there's there's lots of theories about it, but that's all there is. You know, there, um, there's been some DNA uh, studies, you know. Um, so David Politis. Um, for missing 411 he he's he's been involved for years uh, researching bigfoot as well as missing people and he's 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 collected a lot of dna um that he's got a method where he he gets up high on a tree um i like a pine tree and s smears an area with uh, bacon grease and peanut butter it smears an area uh, all the way around the tree and then he'll take some uh, clear uh, tape you know like a masking tape or packing tape you know like uh, the kind you pack boxes with and he'll wrap the tree a ways down um where the uh, sticky side out you know and i don't I mean, you got a monkey with everything to make that happen, right? But his his theory is that the Sasquatch will lean up there to get their hands on this this uh, bacon fat and and peanut butter, and and their chest hairs will be on this uh, sticky tape. And when they pull away, it'll pull some hairs out of it. And I, I guess. In a fair amount of the situation, the hair follicle is is still attached to the hair, so so they're getting the DNA off of the follicle. And he sent that in to uh, separate labs. Uh, you know, like I think at one point he said he used uh, three different labs: one in the state of California, and one up in uh, Canada and uh, something i think back east and there was was uh, one of those labs had had 
had come back with no finding, you know, and I can't remember which lab it was, but the other labs have always come back with a DNA uh, profile that is mitochondrial DNA, which is the female side of, of the DNA. And the male side is always unknown. So I, I think that, uh, I think just based on that, that uh, Bigfoot is is the offspring of a human woman. Obviously, that's true because of the DNA proof. And the other side is a male of unknown origin. And now, I don't know. Mike, what's your opinion, though, from your experiences and your encounters on what they are? Well... Um, I think it is is a, something that perhaps a developed along the same path um, that uh, humans did. However, I, I have different apparent, uh, opinion of where humans came from. You know, I I personally believe that uh, there's there's proof as far as as what's written in the bible and there's there's a lot of uh, stuff there you know the bible is just a collection of ancient writings that you know a religious people i think it it was the catholics who decided uh, uh which ancient writings would go in the bible and there's other a- ancient writings like the book of enoch you know which uh, they left out because it it would interfere with the narrative, you know, they want us believing, but it, but that being said in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible and in the book of Enoch, it's pretty clear that uh, there was, was space travelers who came down in, in spacecraft, if you will, and landed. And I think that those people, they modified the DNA of, what hominids were here and developed a more advanced uh, race of people, which became us. And I think potentially they could have done the thing or the same thing and created Sasquatch. Yeah. So that's what I had on. That's an excellent theory. And, um, you know, I hear about David Politis's work all the time and I just like to hear people's personal thoughts just because I feel like, you know, the scientific world has failed us. So, Depending oh, yeah. on those methods, you're just going to get blank answers in a sense, just because all the work they did, you know, their answer is it's a people, they're people, but you know, they're luring them in with bacon grease and peanut butter. Some are yeah. reported to be, you know, up to 13 feet tall, if not taller, they're hairy and they can live out in the woods. You know, they look like people, they, they have behavior like people, but to me, they're nothing like people personally. So if, you know, that's the answer that they concluded with the analysis of the hair. To me, there's still a lot more answers. And like you said, the Bible, there's a ton of information in there and a lot of clues of our origins on this planet. And they mention giants. So to me, there's the giant theory stands because people claim to find giant bones and there's been all these ancient civilizations with giants within their civilization. And there's all kinds of cultures and civilizations that have just been buried and wiped away. And you hear theories and things about ancient cultures such as Atlantis. So it's hard to say where the Sasquatch actually originated from since a lot of the land on this planet and the ancient world is gone now, you know, it's under the ocean. So there's right. answers that we may never find. Well, and, and, you know, you and I could talk for days about this. I, I think so. I've been, studying, <laughs> I've been studying this stuff for, for almost 40 years. Mm-hmm. And my wife, you know, she, she goes, all you do is you research Bigfoot and alien stuff, you know, um, and, and ufos but but i know ufos are real because i've seen a lot and i was an aerospace engineer and i won't mention the company i worked for but i worked for them for for like uh, 34 years and 
I've seen the documents. I have talked with the people working on UFO technology. I know they're real. I've seen I've seen the documents. I spoke with the people. We won't say the company's name, but you can confirm no. this big corporation knows about yeah. aliens. And it's 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 a major aerospace uh, company. I wanted the big two, and um, I've seen a lot of UFOs. I because I would purposely go out at night with a spotting scope and look for them. And if you look up with binoculars enough times in the clear sky, you'll see one. I mean, within a week, you will see one and you'll know it's not an airplane because how they move. When we went hunting, my uh, two lifelong hunting buddies and I would go down and hunt uh, mule deer and elk with muzzleloader for for probably more than 35 years. Every year, and we hunt on private property in the Palouse area, which is uh, southeast Washington along the breaks of the Snake River. And we'd be back there miles back in on, on private property. And the hunting was fabulous. And at night, you know, we'd get back, uh, clean and skin the deer and can bag them up and put them on crushed ice and then we'd make our barbecue and drink beers and we break out our spot and scopes and we just just start watching the ufos because the ufos were there and we watch them every night and uh and they were close so but uh, we're never threatened and never visited yeah and um so yeah, there's 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 a lot out there that is reality that our federal government doesn't want us knowing. And I I think it all re- it all revolves around their selfishness, their greed, and their lust for money and power. Yeah. And now we're you know, our our country's falling apart right now. And that's mm-hmm. pretty frightening. Yeah, that shows signs of greed. Yep, yep, ultimate greed, and mm-hmm. and they lie. But um, I'm sure that they've had this uh, UFO technology for for many years. You know, some speculate as early as 1941, and that one uh, German uh, scion. Um, I'll say this word. Um, He's a scientist. He's dead now, but his name was Werner von Braun. Mm-hmm. And he's on record. He said before he died, he died of cancer. And just before he died, he said that we have the technology to take E.T. home. Yeah. And he that, invented that, the rocket, correct? The propulsion he, system. That, that uh, Saturn Seven. I think is what they call it is at that point it was the most powerful rocket engine um, and they used it all the way to the space uh, shuttle mm-hmm. and now i saw just last week i was watching elon musk um, he's got a channel on youtube and he's got a new rocket and they just launched it a few days ago, and it has something like a, a 10 times the thrust power of the rocket motor that uh, Werner von Braun made. Um, so it's pretty powerful. And they launched the rocket. It made it off the launch pad, and it, it, it uh, made it up to leave behind a stage one uh, rocket. And then what was left uh, continued up in the sky, but then it failed and it seemed to have had lost its guidance uh, system and started to head towards the earth. It went back up and then it exploded. But they they regarded that as as a uh, um a good thing anyway, because all they wanted to do was get it off the launch pad to prove that the motor worked, and it did work. Yeah, they're making leaps and bounds. 
Um, when you yeah. were steelhead fishing, do you feel like the Sasquatch were trying to take your fish? <laughs> no. I think if they wanted my fish and me, it would have been a done deal. But I'll tell you this. When that one was following me out and I had those those uh, two steelhead in my hand um, and my 357 in the other, I had contemplated if it came out, I was going to throw the fish at him. But yeah. that never happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to the orb that you've seen, and again, I apologize mm-hmm. for cutting you off. I just wanted to finish your eye sighting before we moved on to the next topic. Mm-hmm. That orb mm-hmm. that you've seen, it was a green color, correct? It was. What, it was, what it size was, was it? Was it like the size of a basketball? You know, it it it's pretty hard to to get any real scale because it was nighttime. And I I think it was probably about as big as a beach ball. A lot of people say that the Sasquatch are connected to energy. I've seen the orbs myself, and I've also seen Uh the orbs associated with Bigfoot activity and following with some encounters. So I Mm -hmm. definitely believe the orbs are tied into the Sasquatch. And, you know, they've evolved spiritually as well. So I think there's other things that they know about this planet and certain energies that they can possibly harness that we're not aware of, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of talk of uh, parallel dimensions. Um, there's talk about the use of meditation to advance your consciousness to the next level. There's all this stuff, and a lot of it. I mean, I'm listening. I'm gathering uh, more information all the time, but uh, as far as uh, as do I believe it, I'm about, I don't know, 75% uh, in, on some and, and others I do believe. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, that I've been, I've been involved with astral projection and remote viewing, and I know it's real because I've done it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very reluctant to, to, uh, bring that up at, at, uh, say a gathering of people. In fact, I won't. Okay. Because people think you're crazy, but I, I have gone on journeys and it, it wasn't related to drugs or alcohol. Um, I know of people who, who I greatly respect, like, uh, Graham Hancock, is a guy that I think everybody should should be watching as much as possible. Um, he's he's used ayahuasca, which is a uh, it's a concoction, a mixture of, of certain plants that uh, has been used for years in South America in the Amazon, where you take this and it'll bring you to a higher state of consciousness of consciousness and a lot of uh hallucinations and he's done it quite a few times but yet he he's still he's an educated man and um he admits he's not a scientist but uh, he's a journalist but uh he's very with it i don't think the guy's off his rocker at all and he's had experiences you know like out-of-body experiences and i have too and I know that a lot of people have no belief in that stuff. I I knew a guy that was in the army and I met him at work. <clears throat> and for a certain amount of my time, I had to, to ride a bus to and from the work site. And I met him that way. And uh, of course we, knew all about you know what uh, we were doing and uh, uh, we struck up a friendship and uh, um, he said that uh, he was in the army and in him like a secret uh, program for for 23 years or something like that where uh, he was doing remote viewing 
an astral projection uh, for the government. And uh, there was a group of those guys, you know, uh, 12 or more people that he knew of, and they were doing the same thing. And I says, you know, I, I've done astral projection. And he, he looked at me, he goes, really? And I says, yeah. At that point, you know, we had had conversations because the bus ride would be like one hour bus rides each way, right? And uh, we looked forward, you know, to having our talks about stuff. I told him all about the Bigfoot. And he says, yeah, I, I never seen a Bigfoot, but I know they're there because the government knows they're there. And the people that he was working for at the government told him uh, Bigfoot hits a real creature. Yeah. Well, if and, humans can tune in to that, I'm sure the Sasquatch yeah. can. So that's a very good point. And maybe the Sasquatch are taking or using some type of form of communication that we aren't aware of. Yeah, there, there's, there's a one place I, I, I would go and hunt, and eventually I had to stop going there because the dark feeling was just overwhelming. And <clears throat> it's up on the border of Washington, up in Okanagan, and um, there. <laughs> I won't uh, say the name of the mountain, but it is is north of uh, Loomis, Washington. And there is some really good deer hunting up there for both whitetail and and mule deer. Um, There's bears up there and there's bighorn sheep up there, too. And there and there's moose up there, believe it or not. But this one little mountain I would go up on that my dad hunted as a child. It's a private mountain, and at the time, I had a key to get up onto that mountain, and, and my grandmother, she had left me the family ranch. I was the owner of the ranch, and I had that ranch for, for uh, 25 years plus, and eventually had to uh, sell it because I, I got in a legal battle with the EPA, and those guys were going to sue me for a million and a half dollars for for something that wasn't my fault eventually i got out of it and uh but there was a mountain up there that i would always go up and hunt and it's a pretty long hike and you're up there in the middle of nowhere and there's this one place on one of the fingers of this mountain where there's these huge pillar rocks and they're everywhere and they're sticking straight up and i have no idea how they could have got there, I, I don't know if it was man-made or it was a geological thing, but, you know, these big pillar rocks, and, and they're anywhere from, from 12 feet to maybe as high as, as probably 20 feet. And they're arranged in something that could be construed as a pattern, but they're there, and there's a lot of them. I mean, like maybe 15 or 20 of them. And whenever I got close to those things, I got a dark feeling as almost to the point I could vomit. And the fear and uneasiness, it was just, it was thick. It was overwhelming. And I'd always have them back out of there and I'd leave like, the hell was that? And it happened every time. And the first one, it happened, that it, I mean, I wasn't even thinking about anything spooky or anything. I was hunting deer. I was hunting big bucks. And all, I get this feeling like you shouldn't be here. So I told people about that. And you now again, but uh, that's a weird feeling. Yeah. And it sounds like you've had a lot of run-ins with the Sasquatch. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but I won't go look for him. I'm not like you. I, I see you walking around and I've gone, man. And I've had people say, well, I've been out in the woods and I've looked for Bigfoot. And I've never seen anything. And I say, you know something? If you're looking for Bigfoot, you will never find one. Mm-hmm. If you want to see Bigfoot, go out in the woods and uh, do your own thing. And trust me, they will find you. Absolutely. That's 100% correct. All right, Dan. Well, I think you did a very good job at explaining your encounters and experiences. And most Mm -hmm. of my questions I had to mark off just because you were answering, answering all the questions as you were telling the story. 
Right. You know, one thing that I do want to say, it, you know, the listeners, I hope they're paying attention. You know, um, I think far too many people, their first response is, well, let's go kill one. And and even Fred, you know, he 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 says if he, you know, with all the experiences that he's had up in Alaska, it sounds like the 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 uh, Bigfoot up in Alaska are are more dangerous and more prone to cause you harm than what we're dealing in Canada and the United States. But I, I would urge people to not shoot one because um, if you're being charged and threatened, well, that's a different story. But if you don't have to kill one, don't, I mean, there's no reason for it. You know, just if if you want to prove that, that Bigfoot exists uh, to yourself, well, go out in the woods and do your thing, go fishing, uh, go hiking and pick mushrooms and, and, and just just wander around in there like uh, the last thing on your mind is anybody watching you. And eventually, he, he, if you do that enough times, uh, um, you'll find that uh, they'll find you and, and you may see one. You'll hear something. It, it'll happen. But as far as uh, shooting them, I wouldn't do it unless I was I was in danger of my life. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Go in the woods and focus on something and don't go in like a Navy SEAL like you're looking for something in particular. Oh, let me tell you, you just, okay, so just um, not long ago, I think uh, last year, I I was going to town. Um, and I got a drive away. So, you know, we live up against the watersheds, you know, the uh, Green River watershed and the Cedar River watershed. Um, and those watersheds go for miles. Um, but where we live is really rural. I mean, we have elk in our yard, you know, and, and deer. I told you about the mountain lions and the one bear. And uh, so I'm driving to town and I get I don't know a few miles away from home and there's a place uh, where you got a fork in the road and I go left and west if I want to go to town well right there parked at the edge of the timber in a big pullout is is a sheriff's car and there is a big SUV black with black windows and it had markings on the side of it but I didn't I recognized what the markings meant. And there was uh, three guys standing out there. One was a sheriff, and he was about, I don't know, 50, a little bit overweight. And uh, there was uh, two guys to the side of the black SUV. And these guys were all dressed in camouflage. They had, had, had a tactical backpack on each of them. They had a huge uh, sidearm on them, and they had assault type, assault type uh, rifles, a semi-automatic in their hands. They had a radio uh, sticking out of the back of their tactical uh, backpack, and they had on their vest. It was loaded with clips, you know, for their semi-automatic uh, rifles, and these guys were tall. I mean, six foot four in good shape. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? And and the two guys, the tactical guys uh, disappeared into the woods and headed north. And I watched them. And then the sheriff has starts looking at me and, and I just uh, turned left and I went I went past and I I. I looked at him a real good and I nodded at him and I thought, I wonder if those two guys are going in there to hunt a cryptid of some sort. Yeah. And I thought, what else could it have been? I mean, I, mm -hmm. you know, there's one guy, um, his name is Jeffrey Nadolny or Jeff Nadolny, and he's got that uh, paranormal dogman site. And um, uh, we've emailed each other back and forth a few times, but uh, he's, he's, 
he's mainly focused in on this cryptid uh, known as has as a dog man. Now I've never seen a dog man, but he reads letters from people all the time, and these people have had experiences with dog men. And uh, some of these people are military people. And one of the guys who he he had on for a while, um, who's given a lot of testimony, and he is, his name was Victor Johnson. Now, a lot of people think he's full of beans, and I've only caught him in one contradiction, but it was a pretty major contradiction. But I thought, you know, the guy's getting old, and maybe uh, he just remembered wrong. I and mean, you know, I heard the same story months apart, and in part of the description of his story, it varied. So uh, he lost a little bit of uh, credibility in my mind, but at a, um, his position in government was a hunter of Bigfoot and dogmen. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my experiences. And like I said, you know, you and I could talk for hours about this stuff, but I know you got a time limit. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you getting in contact with me and wanting to share your story. And like I said, I want to thank Fred for putting us in contact. Right. Yeah. Fred's a good guy and you are too. So you keep doing what you're doing because it's important and be careful out there. Well, I appreciate it. And you be safe if you go back to those woods and go elk hunting, you know. There's a lot of activity in there, so fall. be careful. I'll, I'll be going in the fall, but, but I'm going to be carrying a 270 with me, and I think that'll do it just fine if I have to. Yeah. So you take care of yourself, and we'll talk to you, you know, in the future. Yeah, that sounds good, and if you have any more encounters or experiences, feel free to reach out. I will. I will. All right, Dan. Okay, you take yeah, sorry to cut you short, and it was an oh, excellent you have, interview. You've given me more time than most of the people <laughs> you talk to. <laughs> okay. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, okay. and um, you have a good day, and I'll reach back out whenever I upload the video. Yeah, I, I, I want to see that. Okay, thank you very much. All okay, right. take care. Thank okay, you. Okay, bye-bye. Mm-hmm. All right, that was a really interesting Bigfoot encounter, and he got a really good look at the creature. He could see its eyeballs moving, he could see the wrinkles on its face, and the hair blowing in the wind. That's how my encounter was. I got really close to the juvenile Sasquatch, and I could see its eyeballs, I could see the expression on his face, and I could also noticed that the wind was blowing its hair around that's how close i was so i could really relate to this man's story and i could tell that he was telling the truth and this was a genuine bigfoot eye sighting encounter and it was a pleasure to have him as a guest on the show to tell his experiences i know we had a lot to share and we probably could have talked for many many hours but unfortunately I ran out of time and these videos can only be so long because I add these high resolution videos so if an interview is two or three hours long it will take a long time to upload on YouTube and to create the video itself so we will have to do a part two and like I said I appreciate Dan for coming on the show and for sharing all his experiences with everyone that's all I have for today everyone If you can, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification, and if you have a Bigfoot encounter that you would like to share, please contact me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe and take care.